the Atola. And most tools, I want you to understand, even if whether you buy the Atola or you buy the Salvation Data tools, you buy a PC3000 or you buy a DeepSpar or you buy any other tool, it doesn't matter. Most of them have some way of giving you some kind of feedback if they're data recovery tools and they will tell you some of the content. And so you, most of them will have like a media scan or something like that. And so as an example, and, and, and this is something like when I look at this, my first thought, just to kind of give you an idea of what I'm looking at, like if you do a media scan, what is this telling you? A lot of bad sectors. A lot of bad sectors, what would those sectors equate to? What? A bad head. Right. So what's happening here, all right, so how many heads do I probably have? If you just look at this picture. Yeah, I think I have I think I have four probably. Right? Yeah, so, but it's all just measuring the size. That's all, that's all trying to figure out how far they are apart. So if you figure, well, this is a chunk, this is a chunk, this is a chunk, maybe I got four. And then it repeats, right? Same problem over and over. So I've got four, approximately. And so let's assume that if I've got four, I could turn this one head off. If I could just say ignore this head or turn it off, read the rest of the sectors. Now people are going to say, well, you're not going to get anything worthwhile because you know, people always had this thought you're writing data all the way down through all the cylinders in the platter, which is not true, right? So they're written by what's called zone tables. Let me show you a zone table real quick and we'll pop back to this picture. This is a zone table, as I quickly discussed over here. This is an actual zone table pulled using PC3000 from a drive. So you could actually see, like you can actually look at what your zones are and where this head is and what that content is. Now, here's what happened. When we switch from the method that we use to read drives up to about 8 gigs using a basic phenomenon for cylinders, heads, and sectors, and all the stuff we used to have to manually enter, we switch to what's called LBA mode, which LBA comes from SCSI. It's a logical block addressing. It's everything sequential. We go from zero to a high number, and that's the end of the drive. And it's all sequential. And so we just have them in order, right? Everybody okay so far? So at that point in time, this whole concept of cylinders, heads, and sectors, it didn't really just go away. We still actually use this as a calculation for what LBA numbers are, but they're all sequentially numbered. And so we're using the same method that SCSI used to talk to this content. So we w went to a mode called LBA 28-bit mode. And so we will read content and address it according to its location from zero to max LBA. When we did this, they decided, well, hey, look, we, you know, we want to know where the fastest locations are on the drive, and we want to put most of the data at the beginning there first. So when you're looking at a drive, and you're looking at this, let's say, here's your platter. Now, the drive spins at the same speed all the time, so it's not faster any particular place on the drive based on how fast it spins. It's faster based on how much data you can store. So as you can see, I've got a bigger slice of the pie out here. And so more data can be stored there without moving ahead. The head will stay in the same location as I'm reading data all the time. So I don't have any problem with latency or anything like that switching to another location or moving the heads through cylinders down through multiple platters down here at the bottom or anything like that. Everybody okay so far with this concept? LBA zero is out here. And then the max LBA makes its way to the inside. So our higher numbers are here towards the center, where the platter, where it's slower because we have less content stored. So the head only, only sits here. It's only going to read this amount of data at a time. Everybody go to this concept. So we go from zero to max and OBA. And so, so zone tables are broken up according to how fast the locations are on the platters. And so they're like little football fields. So you'll go to this location, to this location, and so on and so on. And so this part of the drive is going to be faster because the head has to move less, there's more data stored there, and it can just hover in that same place and read the data. So there is a spot where the amount of time that it takes from here for the head to switch to a spot underneath the platter and come back to the outer edge on the next platter below it, there's an amount of time 
that they calculate to figure out whoever figures out what the zone table size is going to be. They say, well, now it's going to take longer to read this data than it is to turn off the head and come back out here and read faster on the next platter. So it's like little football fields on the drive, on the platter, and then they're written on both sides. So at some point in time, it'll go here, and then it'll say, oops, this is no longer fast enough. Let's go back out here and go underneath, go to the next platter. It's actually from the bottom up, not the top down. But that's how they're physically breaking them, breaking them up. So you can actually see that the speed's going to be staggering as it goes from the outside to the inside. Now, all of our operating systems and our file systems are based on this. Now, the file system doesn't really do anything shuffling content around. They're kind of bleeding the edge between operating systems and file systems and what actually happens between those. But let's say you know Windows XP has the ability to do performance increasing content. Like it actually looks how often do you access this file. Let's move this to the outside edge of the platter. So during performance increasing things that it does, it moves content that you might have opened up here to the outside edge of the platter as close as it can get, depending on what locations are open for it to write to. Everybody good so far? Right? So, and the MFT, the master file table, that's our catalog for where all the data is on our drive. We have a master file table and the drive will reserve as close as it can get to the outside edge, the first 12, or at least in Windows XP, the first 12.5% that it can write there for the master file table and then reserve it. So there'll be a chunk that's written on the drive that takes up 12.5%. And then that decreases if files, if it's not needed, it'll decrease the size and files will encroach on it. But uh, that's one of the reasons why it started adding this to this outside edge. So that's what this zone table, that's what this content is supposedly be. Like here's the beginning, here's the outside edge, those lower LBA blocks are in the fastest location. So let's go from here to here and let, that's how many LBA blocks are going to be in the first zone. And so on and so on and so on. And it's going to stagger this data according to speed. No, a manufacturer makes this decision and somebody tested it during their manufacturing process, decided how many blocks are going to be in each of those, and then somebody decided what this table size was going to be. No. Yeah, they, they changed from drive to drive, they changed from manufacturer to manufacturer, they changed from family to family. I mean, they're always, you, you don't know. You don't know what they're going to be. You can kind of find out. Anybody use Bonnie Plus Plus? Anybody ever use a Linux tool called Bonnie Plus Plus? There's a tool called Zcav that they made for, that is part of Bonnie Plus Plus. And it does what's called zone constant angular velocity tests. And it will actually test drives or alignment in drives or even rate arrays for what the fastest locations are. Now, it doesn't really know what the zone table is, but you can see it. You can kind of figure out what it's doing and where the zones are. So let's say your job is database optimization then your job might be to figure out where the fastest content is on the platter and then to write that to that location or make a partition there, right? It is for us to do like turn off heads and deal with the location and where they are on the platters. And uh, you also will know like if you have a bad head that zone will be associated with one side of a platter. So, so these are located based upon where their head locations are and then their zones are. Now, you don't have to know where they are, but this one of the things I'm trying to explain is that because data is like this, like if you actually look at this now, and you're looking at how this data is written in these chunks, so we're looking at zone one, and then zone one is from zero to four million, right? So you already know there's two gigs right there. And that's two gigs, then you actually continue down. You may end up with another, there's head zero, zone two, head zero. So these are contiguous from four to four, and then from eight to here, right? So we're at 12, so that's now six gigs, right? Yeah. So now you get a drive in, and you look at this, and there's a bad head. Are you going to recover what you can before? Hang on a second. Yeah. You're almost there. I'm getting it. I'm glad you're thinking my way. So, uh, so basically what I'm saying is we've got a location on the platters on one side of one platter that six gigs is contig contiguous. So if that happened to be, if I happen to get lucky and you know if we're looking at our drive in a linear fashion and we're looking at zero and max LBA and I happen to get a chunk that was the my documents here. Now 
Again, it doesn't know anything about files, and we're going to get into operating systems, file systems, all the other crap, whatever. But let's just assume that we got lucky, and uh, you know, my photo library is contiguous, right? Huh? So what does that? Yeah. Well. It's not as bad as it used to be. It's actually pretty good comparative, but uh, like a Mac, this would work fine. This would be like, because it's going to be contiguous. That's correct. And then they divide these things up. So you may end up with a bigger chunk of content. But, you know, so in this particular case, I'm looking at maybe six gigs of data that might be contiguous. And for Word documents, that'd be fantastic, right? Because even if it's Word documents and they're, you know, 60K files, I've got a great chance. I've got a lot that I can pick up in here. It's pictures and videos that are a problem, right? So thinking about it like this, it's linear. So, so when you're looking at this picture here, let's talk about this picture for a second. Again, this isn't meant to be like a... I know you might not be able to see this, but see this number over here says zero? And then this one's 409600. And then 819200. Alright, so let's go through all, all, the, all the file system. Fat. If this was fat, where's the fat allocation table probably going to be? Yeah, out here, right? So if I find my file... Now, keep in mind, whatever your catalog is, every operating system, every file system has a catalog of some kind that keeps track of where its files are, a table. So they all might call it something different, but fundamentally they all have one. And if you have that, that's where all your metadata is. That's all the things that like my file name, my directory structures, all this other crap that goes with it that tells you where stuff is. And your attributes, dates and times and all that, all that's there. And if you can find that, you can get structure back and you can get file names and you can get things people care about. If you can't find that, what's your solution? Carving. carving and carving is a it is job. and painful and a mess and not very I mean you have fragmentation and sparse files if you have an MFT what's stored in the MFT that's valuable all you forensics people besides that what else is there the clusters with the files no user security what if my file is 931 bytes and less in the, MFT, yeah. in the MFT. I actually lose files. Even if I can carve stuff, if it's a small enough file, it's in the MFT. It's actually in the catalog. And I lose that file. So text files and configuration files and things like that. Those are those are in that in the MFT. What's carving? So so carving is when we have a header of a file. So for instance, um, I have a QuickBooks file or a, an executable as an example. Executable start with MZ in the first beginning component of 512 bytes. So in the very first beginning part of the record, this raw data, there's going to be an MZ. And then it will have a footer and it will call executable. I don't know what its name is and I don't know what it is, but here it is. Or if I have a JPEG. See, JPEGs are great because JPEGs are still a picture, right? So if you have a JPEG, it starts with FFD8 and it ends with FFD9. So you just carve the space in between. But what's your problem? Well, you do miss your... Yeah, exactly. If it's fragmented, the rest of the picture might be someplace else. Or something else might be stuck in the middle. You don't have a name of the file either, but it is embedded in some of the XF information. You can get some information from inside the picture. But... Okay, so if you use carving, you get that back? You, you... Well... We'll talk about fragmentation and other stuff. We'll get there's a lot more to it than this, but uh, but you can get if it's contiguous, if it's in contiguous space, then yes, you could recover that file. If it's not, then you're screwed somewhat. There's a little bit of a solution. Yes, sir. Does any sector point to the next? No, no. The sectors all stand alone. Uh, that's what the actual table is. That's part of the file system, depending on what that catalog is. Uh, so if you're in Linux, you're looking at like inode tables. If you're in Mac, it's uh, HFS catalog, catalog ID nodes, uh, and MFT entries, file records, and index records in the are physically containing that content. Nope. Uh, pretty much. Nope. None of them really have anything. If you don't have those catalogs, you just have raw data. So. 
you don't really have an easy way for that to happen. Now, fat has an unusual thing, and it works half the time or doesn't, but there's a like a current directory dot and dot dot. They're painful to get or tr painful to find, and they're almost impossible to do, but you have to like hunt for these current... Backups, though. Two and has the also. Yeah, if you have those backups, but the fat tables are also small, and so they're the first thing overwritten, because now what happens is... Uh, if you have fat, fat 13, fat 16, fat, I mean, fat, fat 32, 32, fat 13, what 13, that's the same thing. Uh, so if you have fat 32 or fat 16, if your drive is formatted in that way, they have small tables at the beginning. And most of the time when it's reformatted or overwritten, it's reformatted or overwritten by either NTFS, which then slaps a big MFT at the beginning of the drive and overwrites that component, or it's uh, written by HFS. And so HFS then slaps all that stuff for the catalog at the beginning of the disk as well and partition structures. So then the table is overwritten fairly quickly. And so then it's just raw data on the rest of the drive unless you can manually figure out where the, these dot files are and then figure out what, and it doesn't work all the time because if any of the sectors have been overwritten, they're not able to be located. You actually are just cutting raw space. So this is actually a Wednesday discussion, but. Okay. So, so when you when you're looking for when your computer is looking for file, yes, going by the LDA or by sector number. So LBAs. So in Windows, so MFT, they get converted to clusters. So whatever you used for the cluster. Now understand that this number is somewhat static now, but it will change, and it is dynamic and it can change. But initially, what will happen is your uh, file system is done in clusters according to the number of blocks. So you'll have eight sectors for 4K clusters. And then those are then converted by the file system and asked and requested for the LBA number for where they belong. So that's actually done by your file system and you're requesting from the drive what the LBA number is that is at that location. Is there a table that links the two? N not from a physical to a logical structure that's all stored in the logical level, not in the physical level. But this is where the tools are starting to cross over, where some of them are figuring out what that is. So, so in my poorly done example right here, where I said my documents, so what actually has to happen is stored inside of the file system, there's going to be a table that tells me what the size of my clusters, clusters is. And then this is then going to equate to blocks. And so let's say there's eight sectors, eight LBA blocks in this cluster, then we know this will be the first eight there. And so there's a way to say, in my documents, all of these, even if fragmentation or whatever, we can read them from what this structure would have been, convert them from LBA blocks, and say only get these LBAs. But there is no, your drive doesn't know anything about clusters. It knows about LBA blocks. And so this is actually, or until recently, was mostly a manual process. And it's becoming more automated now as tools are crossing over. It takes a long time for people to write stuff. Just in time for the new file system coming out in Windows 8. <laughs> right, we're about to switch from something we've had for 25 years and get screwed again and the process is starting all over again. It's going to be a while before you start seeing uh, those drives from Windows 8 on there. Well, I don't know. These drives are dying about the day after you buy them, right? And so Windows 8, I guess potentially. Yeah, right. Yeah. So um, I would say if we're looking at Windows 8 this year, by January, you're probably looking at stuff crawling across the desk. I will tell you in forensics, it took a while for Vista and Windows 7 machines to cross my table as far as the case goes. But now it's all time, right? Not Vista, because, you know, the six people who bought Vista, they must have died or something happened. Maybe they upgraded. I don't know, but those six people are not happy today. So, okay. But I like how you guys are starting to get these concepts as we're crossing these lines already. So, and there's a lot of them, actually. And this can become a very complex topic, depending on what you're looking at. So, back to this picture. Got four heads. One's bad, right? And if we're doing fat and we find the fat tables, we're probably okay, right? As everyone has said, 
fat tables are probably going to be here towards the beginning of the drive. We're probably okay. I can read something. As long as it's not in these sectors, I can probably get the file back. Right? So if I image this drive and I just left a hole where all of these were, I could copy out the files that were there. This would just be blank and there would be nothing there. And as long as the table didn't contain those sectors, I'd be good. Right? MST. Where's the MFT probably? Yes, MFT is also going to be out here. Maybe not quite as far as the fat tail, but maybe a chunk right here or something, right? So as long as this is pointing to clusters that have LBAs that convert to these locations that are green, oh, happy day, I can do this recovery, right? Linux, let's say EXT, what do you think? Yeah, at the beginning and then dispersed in something that looks very similar to like prime numbers. The indirect nodes with I nodes will be further up. Right, so they'll be distributed all over the disk. Is that appropriate? Is that what you would say? Like, well, you have a super block. So you, right. you still sometimes repair right. from your super blocks. And is it actually prime numbers with which they set at? Is it because it seems like prime numbers with the way that they cascade the super box? 1892 is, is sort of a. a, a Pretty good, reliable right. number. Not yeah. everything, but the majority. Right. Most times, you will find a, a, a backup superblock or another superblock. Right. Right. So, uh, so we're good. We're we're going to be in here, and we're still going to have duplicate copies of that. Actually, it's redundant all the way across from that perspective, right? That was actually why they in e EXT4 they cut out some of the redundancy because they had to update all the way across a two terabyte disk or something like that. So, so we're probably pretty good as long as, again, we're not trying to recover files from these locations, right? HFS, max. HFS, HFS plus. B-tree. B-tree, that's correct. B-tree starts at the beginning, it's daisy chained together, so it has a structure. See, so MFTs are individual records. They're two bytes, uh, uh, two, five, twelve, case. 1024. So, right. 1024. It's 1024. It's two sectors. And so they're individual. I've been talking all day already. So they're individual records and they stand alone. And you can still find, even with one record, you can still find the files. And in most of the others, the I know tables, FAT, you can find them. If you can find, even using those records, you can find those locations. But Max use HFS, which is a B tree, which is a hierarchical structure. And if you lose the root, of the tree, you lose the branches, or you have trouble getting to the branches to find the branches, and they're undiscoverable. You still call, well, you still call. Yeah, so it's a pain. Still there. Yes, you can if you can find that branch, and then you only get that branch. You only get that part of the branch, and then you lose the tr tree, the rest of the tree. Anyway, you get the point, right? There's a hierarchical structure. Where does it start? Where is the beginning of the partition structure? Structure or file? Well, the partition structure, which is then followed by the catalog IDs, right? So, so if you lose the beginning of that partition structure, because at the beginning of the drive, they write all this crap like patch partition structures and all these other things, right? So, its beginning location is 409.642, right about here. So, if that's the beginning of the root of the tree, and it has all my metadata and all my file locations and things like that. I kind of got to do the repair. Like I can image the rest of this stuff, but I've got to do a head replacement and then clone this. Or I'm going to have a lot of trouble. Does that make sense? So to answer your question, which you asked me earlier, which was if you had this and you could turn off one head and you could image this, would you try to do a recovery at this stage? If I, I would for everything except HFS. So if it was not a Mac, I would try to see what files I have. If I recover, let's say it's, let's say it's a home user and it's grandma's dead pictures that he wants back. That grandma died and he needs these pictures and this is a memory of her. He's going to want those pictures. And so I will probably still get paid and he will probably still have a recovery and he will probably still have valuable stuff if I find any of those pictures there. And so... There's a lot of work involved with disassembling the drive, reassembling the drive, and there's a lot of risk with it. So once I'm done with that round and I actually replace the head assembly, there is a chance that I might not make, I might not be able to get it all. Does that make sense? I may be able to get a portion of it, or maybe I can get all of it, or just a chunk of it. But I'm going to try, but the first thing I'm going to do is image it, and then keep that 
source drive that I wrote that content to, after I've rebuilt the drive, then I'll actually have to add this content. Now, people always say, well, then how do you fill in these holes? Well, they're in the logical block addressing order. So what I'm missing is in order. So once I have these, if I did it with a deep spar, these would already be green. This red is the only place that wouldn't be filled in, and the map file and all the content that's added in a deep spar will tell me that this is what it hasn't got. And it will light, it will fill in the hole. It's actually a hole in my drive. So I'll have space that has not been recovered. And as soon as I hook up the drive and I read that content, it will fill in the holes that it hasn't already turned green. Now if you don't do the head replacement, then you take it out and it's really on top. Again, it depends. Yes, if I run a recovery on this, as I said earlier, if this was anything but Mac, I got a good chance I've got files. And I have a really good chance that in six gigs, I'm going to get lucky with Word documents, Excel documents, things like that. Yeah, I'd probably get file names in this case for a lot of it, and I'd be okay. Uh, but without that, uh, when it tries to go and read these sectors, I'm just going to get garbage in those files. It's not going to work, right? Does that make sense? So I have a good chance I can recover some of the files. Then I go and do the hard work, replace the head assembly. Then I re it can image again and do whatever. Now, the nice thing about this is like when you do a head assembly, if you replace heads and you got four in this case, there is potentially a problem that maybe you mess up one of the other heads. You can't get it quite aligned. But the one you need, you get aligned. So I can turn off all the other heads that I don't need, and I can just read from this one head. So as long as I get this one head and the system head aligned, I can read that, all that content. I don't need to read from the other two sides, three sides of the platter. You always do this first. I always try to do this first. Yes, that's correct. I will always try to do this. Now, again, time and energy and whatever else, this is all you know, how much are you going to put into it? Because at least at this point, this is quick and easy. I can turn off one head, I can image it, two hours later I'm doing a logical recovery and I have an answer. And then I can try the hard stuff. Like now I've got to get a donor drive. So now I've got to buy something. Now I've got to go get a drive that has a head and I'm going to destroy that drive in order to do this. And that's going to cost the customer extra money in order to do that. Or you extra money, however you want to look at it. Does that make sense? Everybody with me? Like a donor drive costs money. And donor drives are not cheap these days because everybody who, when you go looking for a donor drive, they know you're looking for a donor drive. <laughs> like they know there's a whole business now set up with, I've got the drive you need. How much do you want to pay? And that's how it works. And it wasn't so bad in the beginning, but it is bad now. If somebody has a Mac with the NTFS partitioning, they're still not going to try this? So if they have an NTFS partition, now I will tell you honestly, most Mac users could give a flip less about what's in the Windows partition at the end. Now, sometimes it comes up, obviously. But what's going to happen? Where is, if you installed Windows, because if you install it, you use Boot Camp, right? Otherwise, it's a VM, and it's actually in the logical space inside of the HFS partition. Does everybody understand what I just said? Right, so you install Boot Camp. What happens? Like, what's, what's actually going on? What happens when I install boot camp? It's in the first partition or gates boot sector Right, so uh, now if you're talking partition structures, we're talking GPT and we're talking MBR and we have a whole nother discussion to happen there. What happens? Where is the Windows? What actually happens? Maybe further off. What happens? The, the, the Mac first, the HFS first and then the Windows. All right, so what happens is, I don't know if you guys, you guys remember partition magic? Mm -hmm which is now dead because it is owned by Symantec where all good products go to die. Um, uh, so anyway, <laughs> so, uh, so what happens is, is uh, partition magic, which was what the magic really was. We have this MBR. Now I'm getting into stuff that's actually Wednesday, so I'm going to get ahead here and we're just going to end up using some of this material later like because we're going to still finish tonight and then because I'm getting way ahead. But it's a great concept to understand. You have an MBR and your MBR basically has four partition tables or three primary and one. We'll get all into that. But 
what happens is there is a, the beginning of your sector and then there's all this other content in hex and then you have at the end of your first sector for a master boot record how much how many people is this new for who has not done master boot records or know anything about master five boot records yes 55aa who's who hasn't looked at a M master boot record at all okay so a master boot record basically is it's it's keeping track of the locations of these tables that you would normally see in your operating system and your file system for where things are laid out and so that's in the very first sector so at the beginning of the drive and will be in the first location like you saw me do earlier when I went on the deep bar and I went to the very first location and I looked at it and there's no I went to the bottom of the sector to look and see if there's a 55AA the reason I did that most sectors that have an MBR have a lot of content that's written up here at the top for bootstrap stuff and other stuff so and then the actual partition tables are closer towards the bottom and then at the end there's a 55 AA this is what tells Windows look at my partition structure and go mount me if it is not 55 AA Windows will not look at it okay now in GPT which is a new new partition structure that's coming up they write a protective MBR so this MBR is fake in a GPT, unless it's XFAT. And we'll talk about that later. That's a whole other thing, because we're, this is a ball of wax. It just keeps going, doesn't it? <laughs> so, uh, so down here at the bottom, that's why I scroll to the bottom. You can actually have all this content at the top be blank and still have a partition signature down here if it happened to be XFAT or something along those lines with the GPT structure. So at the end of the first sector, it is looking at 55AA to say, Windows, I have partitions, mount me. And it looks at this content, which will be written here. Uh, and there's some calculations for this. And it's 32-bit, blah, blah, blah. And there's a whole bunch of content that's stored there that basically says, here's my partitions. So what would happen is, if I have a, these are my sectors from, from zero to max LBA. And when I want to create another partition, initially what would happen is I have an MBR that says start here and, and how big are you? And it'll have a how big are you that says I'm here at the max. So this is physically going to be a pointer system that says start here and end here or you are this big. And if you wanted to, like this is what partition magic would do. It would actually say, look, I want to make a second partition. So it would look at, let's say I want to go... I want to make a partition 30 gigs. I would go from the center of the drive back out, find 30 gigs, or I would say it's a calculation. Say, here I am. Now I'm going to look at all the LBA blocks that are all in here and see if there's data in them. This is what it would physically look at in your file system. Then it would say, move all these files out here so they're below this marker. And then at 30 gigs, create a new entry into the table at that location, this size, and make it there. It, didn't, it doesn't actually physically write something at that point, but until it gets to here. Does that make sense? This is fundamentally what boot camp is doing. Boot camp is making a partition, and then it's doing it in, in the system itself, in GPT structures and things like that, and then syncing it with the MBR so that we can actually have this table out there of where we're going to put Windows. And then it installs Windows at this location. What do you know about this location in the disk? Slow. It's slow. So by default, Macs are putting Windows in the slowest part of the disk. Isn't that nice? Yes? The disk because it is likely yeah. to be the most unpopular. Yes, that is correct. It is easier for it to go to the end of the disk and do that. Like There was ways to like manipulate stuff. Even Partition Magic really tried to do things in order of space according to this so that it could shuffle stuff back into the disk. Uh, but that's correct. It is because it is most likely the unpopulated area. It's easier to like carve out an area. That's why you couldn't just manipulate partitions in the middle or do whatever. So, well, you yeah, you did, but you had to do a lot of work to actually make that work in some cases. But um, so at least at this point now we have this will be where NTFS would start, right? This is where your partition would, if you have Windows installed on that. So now you're here in the disk, and you'd actually have to figure out where that structure might be and then look at those sectors and then you'd actually have to start your second recovery here. Does that make sense?
to answer the question for if I had windows on the disk and it had the same thing. So that's physically what you would be looking at uh, and do exactly the same thing. It's not going to quickly be an answer by looking at this chart, but we'd have to actually figure out where that is in the disk from that standpoint and see if we had the beginning of our partition structure. Right? Everybody okay? Anything anybody wants to add? Anything different? Yep. Okay. All right. And so again, that's where the zone tables come in. That was entirely the point of most of this discussion was that the data is contiguous in certain locations. You could actually recover stuff even from one side of a platter without having to have the rest of it there.